So really warm welcome to our patient and uh, resident webinar. Today we're hearing about Care Closer to Home and we're really pleased to welcome Dan Leveson, the place-based partner, uh, place-based director for Oxfordshire, uh, part of the Integrated Care Board, and Karen Fuller, the um, director of adult social care in Oxfordshire County Council. So they're going to share a presentation. Um, if you want to questions please put them in the chat and at the end we've got plenty of time for people to to ask questions so I'll hand over to you two. Yeah thanks uh, thanks Veronica uh, and thanks everyone for, for coming out over over lunchtime today it's lovely to see some familiar faces and, and names. Um, my name's uh, Dan Leveson I'm place director for Oxfordshire so that's part of the NHS Integrated Care Board and uh, Karen, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so um, really pleased to be here. I'm Karen Fuller. I'm um, the Director for Adult Social Care, working for the County Council. So we've we've got a, a couple of slides. So we hope maybe 10, maximum 15 minutes of, of a, a short presentation. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion uh, and questions and answers at the end of it. So if we can hold on to the questions and answers, That'd be great. I'm going to put my slides on. So, Veronica, that means I probably won't be able to see everyone. Uh, just from a pre presenter's point of view, it is, it, it's, we, we live in this virtual world, right? But it is, it's great to see the names, but also it's really nice to see faces. So, so maybe when we come off the slides, if people are happy to uh, turn, turn videos on and things like that, it just helps, um, from my point of view at least, with the, with the engagement. Uh, right, so I'm going to try and work this slide thing now. Can everyone see that? Yes. Fantastic, great. So um, I, I'll I'll push on with the slides. I've, I've done my introduction. So what we're here to talk to you about today is uh, part of a program that that we've been doing as a system. So as a health and social care system so between the nhs providers the nhs commissioners adult social care system uh, and our colleagues in in the county council and others we've been uh, going around the county to to talk about some of the stuff that we've we've done over the course of the last 18 months particularly in our urgent care system and and discuss some of the things that we're thinking about doing in the future as well as hear back from uh, from people that we, we have those conversations with. Primarily, the things that we've been talking about is all the stuff that you've probably heard about that we're doing outside hospitals, so in people's homes and in communities. So the Discharge to Assess programme, designed to reduce the amount of time people spend stuck often in hospital when they're medically fit, when they're not getting any benefit from being in a hospital bed. So our, our ability to get people home quickly and support them to be independent and living at home. So the Discharge to Assess programme. Other programmes that we've been talking about is the Hospital at Home and the Urgent Community Response Team. So these are teams of people that look after really quite complex and acutely unwell people in the community and in their homes. And they're teams that are made up of uh, clinical, professional clinical teams from the Oxford University uh, Foundation Trust and Oxford Health, so our community provider. And then finally, one of the things that is actually a flagship uh, uh, part of our recent primary care strategy and a national programme, you'll hear a lot about this, you will have heard a lot about integrating neighbourhood teams, and I think you'll hear a lot about them in the future. So we've been able to establish a small number of integrated neighbourhood teams built around primary care, so your GP practices and the primary care networks involving social workers, involving voluntary sector, all designed to look after people with more complex needs that don't really need hospital. They may need occasional hospital visits, but really it's about the coordination of care for those people with more complex needs. Uh, and we've got a lot of good examples of where we've been doing that successfully. Uh, particularly in Oxford City, particularly in the north of the county in Banbury and Vista, and, and some emerging examples around Wantage and Whitney. These are the places that we've been to so far. So you can see we've got quite a good geographic spread. I think it's important to say 
this is a new way of engaging for us. What we've heard back from people is uh, uh, sometimes people find out they don't know everything that's going on or they find out too late or it's difficult to find out information. From our point of view, I think it's quite unsatisfactory when we just go out and call people in for a, a rainy November Sunday or, or uh, sorry, weekday evening to get people into a church hall and have a presentation and things like that. So this is quite a new dynamic way of doing things. We've been going to events like play day events, like age UK events, like fairs and stuff like that. Stay, stay strong classes in, in Littlemore. I went to one recently in Littlemore and it's a great opportunity to go to where people are and have these conversations. And we've been gathering a lot of really valuable information from it. That's how many we've seen so far. So it's given us the opportunity to actually speak to about 550 people. And it's not an exact science, the capturing of this, but, but we've had a number of conversations in 14 different events. And what we've been hearing from people are things that I think we'll, we'll probably discuss. Uh, stuff about the information uh, that people receive when they're being discharged from hospital. Some stuff around the difficulties about accessing care in, in digital, uh, in, in this new digital world that we live in where everything seems to be online. Uh, but really what we've been talking about and trying to uh, give people some level of assurance is we are committed to A, working as a team, so working for Team Oxfordshire, so it's not really about the Oxford University Hospital or about adult social care or about the voluntary sector. This is about us as a system working to benefit the populations that we serve. Uh, and we're really committed to... Um, providing as much care and support as we can in communities and in people's homes so that they don't have to spend unnecessary time either traveling and driving to, to hospital appointments or being admitted unnecessarily into hospitals. Karen, I'll pass over to you to talk a bit more about Home First and Discharge to Assess. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, um, Dan. So, um, as Anna said, really pleased that we could be here today. And I think, um, you know, myself and Dan being here is absolute testament of the, of the work we're doing across Oxfordshire, across health and social care. And I think um, one of the things um, that we have done a lot of work on as a system is looking at how we can um, support people in a, in a very different way um, when um, they need to, when a hospital discharge is required. So, um, we, we have something called the Home home First and Discharge to Assess, and they're both um, national initiatives. And you'll, hit, you'll see, um, as I'm looking at it, on the, um, on the uh, right-hand side of the side, where quite often you'll hear people in terms of different pathways, and that simply um, aligns to whether, you know, how much support people need um, to get home. One of the things that um, we um, identified as a system and um, some of the, the stuff that you identified from feedback from, from residents of Oxfordshire is that, you know, when, when it came to the point of people being discharged, there wasn't always the right pathways um, set up across the system. So we have um, fundamentally um, realigned what we do as services and are looking at how we maximise our workforce across all, all, all areas to make sure people get the right care in the right place. So in doing that, so if I talk about... Um, home first um one of the things um you know from probably from quite a lot of national um uh, sort of investigations is that the longer people stay in hospital the more deconditioned they come um and it is um you know of better to get people home quicker with the right support around them to their own home. So, so one of the things that we've done is, um, particularly within the County Council, is um, we've realigned all of our um, hospital-based social workers, which, um, you know, comprises of probably just around 100 staff, um, and we've, we've put them into localities, so they're place-based now. So rather than that, we've got a very, very few um, uh, staff members in the hospital, um, and which enables us to actually have those conversations at at, in somebody's home rather than at their bedside which is is, is fundamentally um, something that we needed to do differently so one of the things that you'll see as we as we go through this is looking at how we work as a system to sort of change our pathways to support that um, so um, home first discharge to assess is um, you know it, the success of it, it has been um, predicated on the fact that we've set up something called a transfer of care hub team, which is a team um, based within the hospital. Again, it's a multidisciplinary team. So, so what that means is that we've got representation from Oxford Health 
OUH and, and the County Council. Um, and we look at decisions are made, every um, hospital discharge decisions that are made within that multidisciplinary team about what is best for that individual. And quite one of the things that we quite often say is um, we describe what a person's needs is rather than prescribe. So um, essentially um, it enables us to um, support people to go home with, you know, a, an outline of what we think care is needed. And then we do that assessment in an in individual's um, own home. Um, there has been, um, you know, it is quite a fundamental shift. Um, and I think one of the things that um, we have benefited from is that we have, you know, the, the, the individuals and the staff capacity to follow people home. So there has been quite a lot of a myth is that people go home and they wait for up to 40 hours to 48 hours to be seen. We see people on the day they're discharged and we make sure um, that we work with um, our, our fabulous care providers to, to ensure that um, you know care is wrapped around those individuals. So um, essentially that is just a little bit of information around that. So um, and I think as I you know reiterate that um, it, it's much better at home than um, you know within the hospital setting. I'm just going to talk a little bit some, you know, something about um, what we've done in adult social care, which is um, something we've, we've named the Oxfordshire way. Um, and again, I think we really need to look at how we have conversations with individuals. So starting from a point about what's strong rather than what's wrong. Um, and um, this has been built on um, really, really firm found, um, foundations and some work we did sort of during the, the COVID period. Um, we recognised that, um, you know, demand across the system was increasing and we needed to look at changing to meet that demand in a very different way. So the, the diagram that you see on the um, left hand side, as I'm looking at it, um, is um, our Oxfordshire Way visual diagram. That diagram was um, was co-produced um, with the voluntary sector and, and we got some really helpful feedback in developing that together. So essentially with the population and communities in the middle um, and looking at how we can have community support um, and really, really importantly, prevention, um, you know, um, maximise um, before we actually move on to formal support. So again, that has been something that we've worked um, very hard um, with our communities and also um, our, our voluntary sector um, partners as well. So um, alongside this, um, you know, the Oxfordshire Way is absolutely fundamental about, you know, um, building resilience within our communities. In, um, increasing independence and looking at how we can you know, socially connect individuals and look at those support networks. I think it would be fair to say quite often, whether it's health or social care, we're not always the best organisations to provide that. And I think why it's fundamental that we work um, very closely with some of our voluntary organisations um, um, within this within this space. Um, and one of the things which um, is is absolutely important is, you know, ensuring that we've got sort of better satisfactions and outcomes for individuals. And I know um, a number um, historically waiting for um, support from adult social care. There has been, you know, there has been some waits. We've worked really hard alongside this to look at, um, you know, reducing our, our waiting times and our waiting list, which has been um, you know, quite successful, I think, alongside working as a system in a very different way. So on here, it's quite a detailed slide this, um, but again, I think, you know, we are, um, you know, we don't always get things right. And I think it's, you know, we are uh, sort of committed as a system to reviewing what we're doing and making changes as we go along. So um, one of the things that that we are, we are um, nationally, um, and we have to measure against ourselves is, um, you know, impact of what we're doing but I think one of the things that is really important here so if you see um the uh the 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 setups for reablement from community referrals by home first. So reablement is where we we support people to be discharged from hospital with um with um, physio and care and occupational therapy wrapped around um, individuals. We as a as a as a, as I suppose a county have not always done so so well in the reablement area. So we have redesigned how we've done this, and you can see even looking back sort of over the last couple of years, where um, you can see the impact that reablement has had. And I'm really proud to say that since um, you know we've been working very differently as a system, our reablement outcomes are um, on the whole above the national average in terms of people. Um, uh, recovering and going back to um, the previous level of independence, which is, is a testament to the work that we've done. 
Um, one of the other things that we um, do get measured on um, is how many um, uh, how many days away from home people are. So how long are they in hospital and away from their own home? And again, um, the the chart on the on the top right hand. Um, side of the um, presentation does illustrate that well, whilst we're going on a downward trajectory, we do have blips, but that's something that we're really keeping an eye on to see what we can do further to improve that. And um, one of the things which I think you'll hear about quite a lot, particularly in the in the national space, is how many um, bed days are, are lost to, to individuals that we don't have um, care to support them home. So again, whilst, um, you know, you can see there that we we optimise our position, and that's something that we're continuing to work on. So I think that is probably a whistle stop tour from both myself and Dan. Um, and it just leaves us, you know, and I think to get into the, the, the opportunity to have questions and answers. And I think it'd be fair to say that, you know, if we can't answer anything straight away, we will endeavour to come back and uh, work through Healthwatch to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, there are a few questions we've had online. So we could kick off with, with the first one of that. Um, I think, Catherine, were you going to put the questions in the chat? Um, but I'll just talk it through. Um, this is a quite specific question. When a frail older person with mobility issues who uses a frame is admitted to hospital for treatment, why are frames not automatically available? And do nursing staff understand that every day of immobility requires a week of rehabilitation? So. Um, Probably, Karen, your best to answer that, are you? Right. I'm happy to take that. So I think that's a really, really helpful question. Um, absolutely. So I think we all as a system recognise, you know, um, the longer people are in bed, the uh, more deconditioned and people do become, as I said. Um, that is something, you know, um, in terms of frames, the hospitals do have... A, a store of frames that they can access but quite often um, that does necessitate um, people needing to be reviewed by um, you know uh, a physio and occupational therapist before that that is issued that is a really good point and I will endeavour to take this away from um, this this you know that that I suppose this um, seminar to see what we can do to, to streamline that further because I think you know we can work probably as part of the transfer care hub team and the home first team to look at how we can expedite that because essentially if people are used to having a frame there is no reason um, I can't see why that cannot be issued relatively quickly and it should be so that's something that I'll take away from this thank you. And it's probably worth adding as well that, that some of what we're doing here is really new for, for for the clinical teams that work in there so so the difference and changing culture it takes takes time so there's there's a lot that we have to do to build confidence amongst our clinical teams that people can go home with a frame without that assessment because there's the assessment that will follow and all this kind of thing so so we are learning as we go as, as well but it's, um, yeah like Karen said it's, it's really helpful Tom. Yeah, so um, is there anyone who'd like to ask a question in the audience? If you do, just put your hands up or um, virtually or otherwise. Or Darlene, yes, I can see you've got your hand up. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Take your, take your, yeah. You can hear me now. Okay. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Lovely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's a comment. It's not a question. The first thing, the first slide, um, the second slide, I thought it was great when you started off the first comment with resilience in the community, re resilience or in the neighborhood. I thought it was great because for, for people in the in the neighborhood to feel they have some power and, and can do something about things linking in. Anyway, that was the first point. I'm not sure, yes, you've talked about hospital as home. I would like to say from experience within the Clifton Hampton area, excellent um, comments from it. Uh, a, a person who was actually uh, referred by the GP to the AAU, the, um, in the John Radcliffe, um, for assessment, the ambulant, ambulatory assessment unit spent quite a lot of the day there, which great, had everything done. They were told that they would 
um, have a service called hospital at home come the next morning. The hospital at home came the next morning, stayed for, um, completed over a period of, I think it's about five days uh, until the treatment was completed. But what was most impressive was that the hospital at home clinicians or the nurses, they, the nurse, different nurses who came, they had a, a phone number, a contact number straight through to the referring doctor from the John Ratcliffe who they could consult and report back on any readings they were getting or any things as the treatment was taking place, immediate contact. I thought that was most impressive. So that was really all I had to say. Darling, can I just say, so in the future, when we're doing these presentations, I think Nicola and Vicar, are, let's just bring Darling to, to tell her, her stories and experiences. And thank you ever so much. It's, uh, so um, I think I can speak for myself, but maybe for Karen. Sometimes we sit and we're a little bit away from from uh, the coalface or, or the, 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 the first line of, of care, but we hear about these experiences from our colleagues leading hospital at home and, and in the meetings that we have. But when 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 I get to hear from, from people like you about a really positive experience, it, it really does. And we know there's there's gaps in this, right? It's not always perfect, but we think I more think, not your story is replicated. I forgot to say that my background is in occupational therapy, many Thank years you. with the Oxfordshire Health Authority. Thank you. Yeah, so can I just add to that? I think that, yeah, agree. That was a really, um, you know, that's why we're making the changes to to, to sort of hear stories like that. Um, one of the things I think is really important whilst, um, you know, that wraparound care, and I think, you know, the hospital at home links into the integrated neighbourhood teams. It does link into home first if, if that's required. And I think one of the things, um, you know, that is probably a big shift in our system is that, you know, that joint working even more so between health and, and social care within the communities. And I think one of the things where I've touched about reablement being um, really, you know, um, reablement and, and hospital um, discharges as being, you know, really important. We've made some improvement in that area. We have also done that within the communities. So our community pickups for reablement are also increasing, which is um, supporting people to remain in home so they don't even have to, you know, um, transfer to hospital. So again, we're looking at it not just from the acute lens. I think it's really important to emphasise that we're doing that within the, um, within the within the communities as well. Thank you. Um, there's three questions in the chat that sort of relate, um, and they are sort of around information and digital access. So um, one was from um, a person saying older people feel alien excluded by the digital access. The other one is two from Karen in the library's community um, about who to connect in, um, who to contact in health and social care and how would they use the um, adult social care line. And then also just to remember the fantastic resource of Oxfordshire Libraries Network who can support people with um, their struggles with digital and internet access. So if you go to a library, you can get ask the librarians and they'll help you get online and understand all of that. Um, and they also um, are really good at signposting, meaning they'll pass you on to the right services if you just walk into a library. So do you want to comment on that at all? So if I if I take um, the first question, so like from, from Karen, um, I think in terms of if we want to contact um, or a community or relative to contact health and social care connections. So, just to be clear, Health and Social connect Care Connections is the roadshow that we are doing in terms of getting out and about. So uh, essentially, if people wanted to um, contact either health or social care because there was um, a query that they had, um, then they would they would need to be signposted through our social and health care team or our single point of access um, for health. And again, as we move forward, we are looking at how we can connect those two even further together. Um, but, but essentially, Karen, you know, I will... Um, I will send um, some information because I think 
a lot of the libraries we do work very closely with within adult social care and um, we do have contact with libraries so I think it's just probably separating out that they're two separate things there um, and again I um, you beat me to it Karen in terms of the the digital opportunities we have um, a number of libraries across um, um, Oxfordshire um, and um, they are very willing and able to help people um, as needed um, to have that digital inclusion um, if that if people are able to travel to libraries and that's something that um you know that we we do offer as a council and i think the other thing just to remind people is sometimes uh, quite often patient participation also provide that support with with patients um so we've got a hand up from delia would you like to speak yes. Delia? yes i'm i'm delia wells i'm from parkinson's uk can you hear me yeah um i have had good reactions and bad reactions and satisfactory reactions on the discharge it all varies it does depend on which part of the county you're at yeah um one of the things uh, that does concern most people with parkinson's is getting their medication on time it doesn't always happen in hospitals because some have to take their medication every two hours or they don't function um it's been some people can control their medicines some people can't because their hands tremor so much so they do need help doing that so that causes a bit of issue especially ranging care when you do have a dearth of uh, problems trying to recruit so that's one of the concerns um one of the things i will add in 1981 there was something called the nine intensive care scheme for the elderly i am so glad you are resurrecting it it was the first time that home helps changed to home carers and i was part of the original research team that set it up and that's exactly what we did then is what you're doing now so i'm quite pleased to actually see it i be, i begin to think i ought to write a social history of care services in oxfordshire so i'm 71 and still working so <laughs> we'll see what happens in the next few years but I'm really pleased it's actually actually happening um, the other thing is is it's not totally clear to a lot of people when charging does step in after discharge from hospital some people are automatically sent a, a fairer charging form and haven't got a clue what to do with it I've had three people in the last six months that have had that and I've had to make phone calls for them um, because they've been told they need care. The other thing, it's not always on time for when they want it. Just recently, a lady said, well, I can't, I, I don't want to go to social services because I can't get the carers when I want them. So I'm paying for it myself and using all my savings because it's not when they want them or when the medication is needed. So um, this is a major problem with Parkinson's. Um, so, for example, you, somebody with Parkinson's needs help to have their food, not actually just put in front of them and say, there's your food. They actually need help putting it, uh, getting it to their mouths, otherwise it goes everywhere. And only a five, ten minute allocation because care staff doesn't work for that situation, unfortunately. So nutrition is not always being taken on board. So that's just a few little snapshots of everything. <laughs> Can I, can I just comment um, here that uh, Health Watch Oxford has been um, doing a, a bit of listening to people using, uh, uh, coming on, on the discharge programme. So anyone who wants to give feedback or comment, and I know many of you have, thank you very much, please do either email us or, or um, we still have our survey open and we've just put the survey link in the chat. We've heard from over 100 people so far about that. I'll encourage them to do that. Thank you. Yeah, lovely. So a, a, a number of points said, um, Delia. So uh, thank you. Um, the um, the point that you made about, um, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, sometimes it's average. I think, and again, I be reiterating that, you know, we are learning. And I guess yeah. it's really important that we hear feedback you know whether it's by the teams whether it's by you know you know myself um because or, or dan because i think it's really really important that you know we can we continue to learn and i think you know um you know as as we have do learn we have made some changes about how we do do things so um again would encourage anybody within this call it's really you know, important good feedback and constructive feedback i think is um it, you're covering everything when you talk about fairer charging everybody should have the conversation you know as part of the um, discharge process about 
the caring charges there's a really simple leaflet that can be given should be given so again okay. if that if that's not being done consistently then it would be helpful for for that to be fed back as part of the team working with them okay. and i think sometimes and we do know um, that, um, you know, that financial assessments, um, you know, it, they can be very complicated. We do have a, a dedicated financial assessment team who can support with queries if needed um, and, um, you know, be willing to, you know, um, to explore that further. If people They've been good. I would just say they, would, they have been good in sorting it out. Yeah. 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 Great. <laughs> Thank sometimes it's and again i think sometimes the charging does become a little bit um of a gray area for some individuals because sometimes the reablement is um it may be um free at the cost of delivery for the first couple of weeks and then when people are assessed as needing it long term that's when charging does come in but that that you know we are looking at the moment at doing a, a leaflet that explains the whole end-to-end -end process and so not just yeah. the charging aspect yeah. of it hey. Um, they were yeah. they were told that they wouldn't be charged when coming from home from hospital, and I think that was based uh, and and then they had a fairer charging thing which was sent a leaflet was automatically sent to them and they found out actually it was just sent automatically they didn't get need to charge because they finished it after a couple of weeks but they kept right. getting demands for payments and filling it in so it was getting <laughs> really complicated. Yeah. And I, and I think we you know whilst uh, that you know. You know, that, that's helpful to hear because I think on one end we were too far the other way where people weren't given enough information so I'm pleased in a way that you know that information was given but I think you know probably some of the narrative around it needs to be um, a little bit more detailed. Medication absolutely appreciate um, Delia with um, specific things like Parkinson's being one of um, you know um, those, those circumstances you know medication at time is um, you know timings are really important you know, like with everything, we cannot guarantee, you know, mm. when carers, um, you know, um, will be there. What I would say is, you know, we will make every endeavour to get it within a time frame. But again, you know, if they go into an individual and that, you know, something unexpected is found, you know, quite often that can delay people. So whilst we do our best, I, I would, it'd be remiss of me to say we can do it, you know, an absolute guaranteed time. And sometimes other... you could do it by a phone call just to buy a phone call to them. I mean, for example, if I was travelling to Kidlington like, the other day, I would have been two hours late trying to get to the client I was going to, being I was a home care organiser working for Oxford City Council at the time, so I could appreciate all the problems yeah. you have. So sometimes a phone call to people might work out, have you taken your tablets? Uh, and then when you're on the phone and they actually take them with you. So, uh, uh, the telecare doesn't always work for somebody because people with Parkinson's get distracted. So if they got an alarm and then somebody knocked at the front door, then that goes. Uh, it, so sometimes it's it, a phone call could actually suffice a lot of people with taking their medicine on time. Just to okay. And I can certainly feed that back. Um, I just wanted to cover the point you you talked about um, medication and nutrition. So um, within Oxfordshire County Council, um, you know, we we our minimum calls are thirty minutes. So mm. we we do fifteen minute calls. Um, you know routinely now and I think that is something that we recognize um, and I think nationally it was recognized that you know people going in and out actually you know dignity and personal care were being compromised so there are only some very rare occasions that we might do a 15 minute calls if say for example it might be medication only and that's all you're going in for which quite often is for circumstances with you know people like Parkinson's where they might need medication throughout the day um, but we, we we do not commission anything less than uh, 30 minutes now um, as part of our framework so hope, so hopefully um, that gives you a bit of reassurance about you know people not being rushed yeah and um, does anyone else have a question um, yes, Barry, would you like to ask your question? Yes. I mean, what we're into here is evolution, aren't we? And the management of change. And my concern in, in Henley is that we're a very traditional community who are, uh, I'm sure Dan would respond to, we're wedded to our bedded culture. Now, what we need to do, in my opinion, is, and hopefully yours, is get the message out there about these changes. And what are, uh, are you waiting for an invitation from Henley or from patient panels or what to come and communicate 
the new ways. Just how are we, you know, how are you getting into our communities? I see you've done 14 community events and seven stakeholder meetings. I mean, are you wanting to do that in Henley as well? Yeah, I think, uh, and I'll, I'll check, I might have to ask Vic or someone to put in the chat if what we have in, in Henley. We have been, we did have one, I can't remember what the event was, it was during August where we were in Henley. Barry, I've met with the the the, the South Oxfordshire patient. Uh, yes, you have, which I'm part. A couple of times, which has been helpful. I've met with local councillors. We had, look, I nearly fell off my chair. We've had a really positive story in the Henley Standard this week. Yes, about, indeed. I would have um, a little so, bit to so do with that. Thing, just to your point about tradition, I would I would say we're all. So so my point of view is we're. I think we're all in in that place. I think we have. Like I said earlier, there's clinical cultures within our system uh, that are deeply ingrained about how how to deliver the types of care. There's we we all have we all have these kind of beliefs and and uh, behaviours that that will take time to discuss and will sure. disagree and we just have to work through it. And um, yeah, so so I'm 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 kind of comfortable with where we are at the moment. And and Barry, I, I think I've said. A few times as well. I'm not sure. However many times people like Karen and I go to certain places and say certain things, it'll only be through the experience like you've had, like Darlene's had, like other people have described that that will really build confidence. But do you want ambassadors out here for the for this the new methods or or what? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and how do we become how, ambassadors? Yeah, well, I think. Do you know what? There's not. A, I don't. I don't think we need to set up a formal like, ambassadorial program and training scheme. It's people having common. What What I believe kind of catalyzes change and and greases the wheel of change is is the fact that we're having a conversation with apologies. I don't know how many we're on here, but forty people. Sure. Now, some of you may believe what we're saying. Some of you may may not believe what we're saying. But but have the conversations with your friends, with your families, with your colleagues, and and just keep keep going with it this th this is like i think you said something about it's a it's a like a process of change or a program of change yes indeed personally i think that's the these movements take time and it's through conversations it's through contacts it's through networks it's through um uh kind of the more that we learn together the better it'll be so i'm i'm, I'm not proposing that we're going to set up a ambassadorial program but i suppose i am appealing to people to what whatever you've heard, good, bad, or indifferent, please share it with your friends and family and colleagues and and others. And if there's questions that you've got, come back to them. But do you want invitations into our community? There's only so I, I'm, I welcome an invitation. I'll I'll send you my diary, Barry. But, <laughs> but yeah, like we when we can, we'll come along. Like and and some of this has been done through the connections work. Some of it is being done. So I've committed. In Wantage, for instance, I've been going back for the last kind of 18 months on a regular basis. I've committed the same in Henley, so I will keep going back. And it's okay. uh, and the commitment is from people like Karen and I and other senior colleagues in the system to go back. So it, it, we, we are committed to continuing to have conversations. Thank you. And uh, just to add to that, a lot of patient participation groups have um, health information days, don't they? And that, I yes, mean, that, yeah. that's an ideal way of reaching patients because you know the patients in in your surgeries and and can do those really positive communications um we'd like to bring sorry. In... oh sorry veronica can I, can I just i can drop into the chat we've had two yeah. um really good conversations already in henley but i think i think Barry, I think, you know, would really welcome that support. And I think as, you know, the positive the positive um, news that was run um, last week in the paper, I think that's yeah. probably testament to our hard work. And I think there is an element, sometimes, you you, you know, it is... It is a leap of faith. I think that cultural shift we do need to look at how we can, you know, I call them stories of difference, how we can we can share some of the, the outcomes that are positive that really, you know, um, illustrate, you know, better outcomes for individuals because ultimately that's why we're here. Yeah, and, and I, I cannot stress how negative some of the conversations have been in Henley or surrounding Townlands Hospital, for example, and so on. And it's very necessary to get positive news out there about these changes. 
Agreed. <laughs> so, um, Sarah Wild, um, you've had a question in the chat. Most of your questions have been responded to, but would you like to ask your question as well? Well, yes, it's actually building up on what Barry said. He said, you know, would Dan like, like to speak to people in Henley? Well, I'd like to know, when are you actually going to speak to staff in hospitals about this access? Um, I don't like to you know, comment on personal experiences. But I've recently been discharged from hospital, never been followed up. I've been given five different appointments, all on five different digital platforms. They don't link in. I've never seen anyone about physio or breathing or anything like that. So although it seems to work fine on paper, in practice, because the staff in the hospitals don't know, it ain't working. Sorry to hear that, Sarah. And uh, so, so on your personal experience, right? Send it, send it to me, and we can look into what happened for you. On on the point about when are we going to share it with with staff and things like that? That that is happening, and it's happening systematically for particularly for the teams that are all involved in it. We're just in the process of we've just approved our final part of the Better Care Fund funding that I was talking about earlier to, to bring in place something called the single point of access, which is for the professional teams working within our system, we'll have a single point where all of the teams coordinate which team has input into which which part of the, the, the system and people's care. So um, uh, it, it is happening. Again, in your circumstance, I don't really know what happened there. So we can look into that, but it is happening. And we've got loads of stories similar to the, the story that Dan and Separate demonstrates. And I've yeah. just shared Dan's email in the chat if that's okay, Dan. Yeah. So I think I think one of the other things I'd probably add, Dan, would be um that you know when people are assessed, I suppose people need different levels of different things. So that's why it's really important. I think you know we've got we can't comment on that personally. It'd be good to sort of track that that that, you know your situation through so if there is any learning we can learn from it um i think that the point around um you know digital platforms and digital um you know uh connectivity is something that you know across the system we are we are continuing to look at how can we how can we um work together better in that digitally space so that in effect you're only telling your story once so whilst um that is genuinely um something that you know does challenge us there is quite a lot of work being done behind the scenes to look at how we can improve that so um essentially um it is watch this space but i think Yorkshire is not unique um in being in that position across the different areas thank you um olivia climber you're from oxford university hospitals would you, do you like to come in with your response or yeah comments? thank you thank you veronica i mean uh not not to add anything particularly helpful, but just to say that I'm grateful to be have been able to join the meeting and, and listening to um, the experiences that people are sharing and their views. So um, you know, we'll be looking to work more on that. I'm very sorry about that experience, Sarah. Um, you know, we, if you share that with Dan, we can have a look at that. But it's definitely work in progress. And as Karen says, sadly, we're not the only ones, but but certainly very aware of, of that. And, and, and thank you for sharing. I think Olivia, we can take away, can't we, the um the point about how we're, we're engaging with our staff and that knowledge because I think you know I know you joined a bit late, but I'll, I'll catch up with you about a couple of points that were made at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Communication every single time, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. And I think just to reflect on some of the themes we're hearing, we're hearing a lot of really positive things about the dis discharge process, but there is issues around communication, communication with staff, um, and also with the, the family members and carers um, still seems to be coming up as well. Um, so Lucy, Ryan, would you like to come in with a question? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so I work in social housing um, and what I'm finding along with our housing officers is that we're going out and doing visits or we're obviously, you know, property inspections, what have you, and we're, we're coming across residents um, who, one, we didn't have a clue that they were, had even been in hospital, um, but that they are then returned home and struggling and, I don't know, I'm just, I guess what I... What I'm trying to ask is, is there um, 
for want of a better phrase, a single point of access that we can contact to try and find out who is meant to be providing support or care for these residents. Um, or even just kind of alerting somebody or a team to the fact that we know that they're struggling and who do we talk to about that? It, it, it's just to sort of raise concerns. Um, you know, we're not looking for personal information. We de don't need to know the ins and outs. So there shouldn't be sort of security or GDPR, um, you know, sort of questions raised. It's just who do we contact, especially when our residents can't tell us who they've been discharged to, who's meant to be looking after them, who's meant to be popping in to see them. I don't know. That's probably quite a big question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. We like big questions. And, uh, <laughs> um, um, so I think that that's multifaceted in terms of what you've just asked. I think I think there is um, there is a, a challenge that, like you say, that quite often and I think, you know, ultimately we work with with adults. Um, and you know, people they do have capacity to make choices. Some people choose not to engage with you know the whole discharge process. Um, individuals, if they are referred via the top, which they all are now, we they would have a support services wrapped around them for those those needs that are identified. If circumstances change when they go home, depending on you know wh whether it was you know a health need or a social care need, we can absolutely um, share with you the social and healthcare team in effect um, single point of access and a single point of access for health. Like we said, we are doing work to see what we can do together, um, but they are they would be your first port of call. But genuinely, Lucy, happy um, if it would be helpful from um, you know across the system to um, you know arrange something outside of here to look at you know that in more in more specific detail just get in contact with me great answer but my internet cut out so i didn't hear any of that <laughs> i'm so sorry oh, no. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for the uh, positive what i basically <laughs> said is, i'll tell you what lucy let's catch up outside of here and uh, i'll um we can have a conversation Thank you can listen you. back um, and it will be recorded on on the uh, webinar so you'll be able to see that on our website later Thank you. i'm well, so sorry <laughs> right i think we've got time for maybe one maybe two more questions i can see that delia you've got your hand it, up it, it's a very quick one when i'm filling in forms for people like attendance slants and things like that they have a discharge planning sheet that is quite useful to send in as, as supporting evidence is that it doesn't include what the proposed care plan is on discharge on that. And that might be a, an easy way for Lucy to have the information if those people are sent home with the just care, care planning with also the guidance notes on what they've been referred to and what's meant to be happening would make that useful. It's one sheet already in existence. It's just a thought rather than that duplicating something fab. else. That would be Sorry. <laughs> would be fab just to have something you know to sort of say have you got a letter have you got a form that we can look at just to sort of so yeah guide us somewhere. at the moment at the moment they don't put on what has been organized like carers coming in etc that is not put on it's just mm -hmm. a medical discharge sheet and it's just i just maybe something could be actually linked to that that when people come home with something that people can look at not just only people like yourselves, but also the family members that yeah. might go in, haven't got a clue. Yeah, thank you. So, so I think, Lucy, if I could just come back on that, I think, again, it goes back, what what, what you might have missed, you know, technology is great when it works, um, was was that obviously a lot of individuals, you know, quite often, you know, you're absolutely right, won't share information. So we need to be really careful. However, if you go in um, into somebody who has been discharged from hospital, if they've got um, uh, discharge to assess or they've got a very woman going in, the contact details of the relevant care provider will be there. So again, it would just be ringing those, those you know, okay. the relevant um, care provider up. Thank you. So, uh, any other comments or feedback? Thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting, and it's great to have got this, um, you know, opportunity for people to really hear about what's going on. Fantastic work, and I think, it, um, as Barry says, it really is about that communication, but also ability for people to feedback when things aren't working well, and and, uh, and help improve services by doing that. Please do respond to our survey, you still got a little bit of chance to do that. 
um, because that's all about bringing in people's voices so that we can try and um, you know point out where, where things aren't working so well. Um, we've got another webinar on the 19th of November. I'm just putting the, that in the chat. That will be on um, hearing about men's health. Um, tying in with all the activities going on around men's health weeks during November. Um, please do sign up to Health Watch Oxfordshire uh, um, news briefing because that is a really good source of sort of understanding and what's going on and, and keeping you abreast. Um, Dan or Karen, would you like to add any final comments? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about how to say, I think um, what I'd, I think what I'd like to say is what we what we're experiencing. So Karen and I and others working in the system is like nothing we've experienced before. As far as we are working, and Sarah, notwithstanding some of the challenges we have about our systems working together as a system as a team, we are working across voluntary sector, the different providers, the local authorities, the NHS, like we've never really worked before. So I think it's really positive. Um, what we're seeing in Oxfordshire is um, some of the best performances in some of the stuff that people are measuring right now than we've seen for a long time. So fewer people are delayed in hospitals than, than they have been in the past. I think, Karen, we're something like third in the country, whereas in previous years we were in the bottom of the country for people being delayed. Karen, I don't I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is right. And I think, again, um, you know, the fundamental shift about how we've worked as a system is is really beginning to show in some of our performance and the measures, but also the fact that um, we've now got systems outside of Oxfordshire coming, asking to come and see, to understand how we've done it, because I think it's quite unique. Um, I think the scene that's working between health and social care, absolutely a, a local place um, perspective um, is, is something something that you know we are, we are learning from and developing and I think again um, whilst we're doing stuff it, it, we are not stopping it it's continuous learning we're changing and we're adapting as we need to because I think Oxfordshire is a is a big county one size doesn't fit all and we know that so I think we're taking all of that into account as we go through. Yeah and, and I think the reason that I wanted to finish with that is um it builds a bit of confidence and momentum, like Barry was saying. Uh, Karen and the County Council have been able to engage carers and the care providers in such a way that we've increased the amount of care that we can deliver in people's homes. That's meant we can stop doing some of the stuff that we used to do because we're confident that we've got a set of providers that can deliver care in homes. We've got the systems and services that we've talked about that are developing. And all of it's leading to people. What I hope is the most important thing is it leads to people being in the places where they should be. So whether you're, you're kids and you're at school, whether you're adults and you're at work, or whether you're older people and at home, that's what we're that's what we're all driving towards, and that's what what we're seeing now. And you've seen in the press recently that the, what signalling is. It's going to be difficult over the next five years, but we are building on a really solid foundation. So hopefully that that's that's been a helpful uh, conversation for you. And I look forward to very future conversations in other places. Super. Terrific. And I think, and I think if I could just say one further thing, I think whilst we're talking here, and I hope you've got the emphasis across this conversation about the one Oxfordshire. So I think the one Oxfordshire approach, and quite often when we talk. Um, I will refer to the one Oxfordshire pound. So it is incumbent on us to make sure that we use the, the money, the limited money that we have absolutely to the best effect for, for outcomes for individuals. And I think sometimes, so Barry, where you alluded um, to um, in beds, for example, previously, yeah. you know, looking at, you know, how we can support better outcomes for individuals, but we need to be bold as a system and say, you know, we are shifting our resources around Correct. for better out and evidence that, and that's absolutely. the narrative with and ambassadors. That must go across the county. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well done, Carol. Great. So, thank you so much to everyone and everyone who's taken the time to come uh, to this and really contribute to a brilliant discussion. I think. Um, and it's it's great to hear sort of 
you know, the enthusiasm and, uh, you know, wanting to really input into supporting those changes as well. Thanks to Dan and to Karen for coming and, and doing this as well. And um, as I said, the webinar will be on our website very shortly. So that's a really good way again of sharing um, with others in your network so they can watch it in their own time and spread, spread that sort of communication. So we will stop recording here and uh, have a good day, everybody. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.